हेलो एवरीवन हेलो सर अस्सलाम वालेकुम वालेकुम सलाम हाउ आर यू फाइन सर गुड सर हाउ आर यू आई एम ओके Sir, I wanted to ask that will you be sharing the solution for quizzes and PSAT and exams? Um, yes, I will share solution for quiz and exam, but not PSAT. Okay. But I will not share the solution to this. Uh, I mean, exam uh, soon after we are done with the virus, then I will. I will share. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me know if it glitches or lags. Okay. Okay. I can see that the attendance is decreasing. Any particular reason? Sir, I don't know, but I did leave a message on the group that we have on the students group, and I told them that this is something that is you know concerning you. So. Okay. So. But today we will again uh, continue with our discussion on few machines. But before we begin, uh, is there any question from last time that you would like me to answer? Sir, I just have a small question. Uh, when we were talking about configuration, uh, you gave us an example of one zero one one and Q seven zero double one double one. So this configuration changes with every step that the DM takes. Yes. Okay. So we can think about configuration as uh, as a snapshot. For example, this is your steering machine. In this steering machine over here, I've just drawn it as a as a block diagram, right? But within the steering machine, there are controls. There is a head. Uh, and there's a tape, and okay, this head is pointing to some position on on the tape, right? And there are some internal state, whether the machine is in Q1 or Q2 or Q3 or Q4 or whatever. And we know there is some uh, some situation with the tape, a position of the head, and the state. So all that thing is called the complete state of the steering machine. Now, if we store all that information, we call it a configuration of a Turing machine. So you can think about it as a snapshot of a Turing machine. So, for example, it's like a screenshot, right? <clears throat> you take a picture of it, and after every step, you can take a picture. So those sequence of steps will tell you that where the machine will go in each step. So it, it's like that. Configurations are easy for us. I mean, they are they're important for us when we will discuss different models of um, uh, different models of steering machine. So it is important for us to know. So, so we know that we already have this complete information in form of uh, of transition function. But the transition function is a general function which tells us that where the machine will go when it reads a certain certain input. Right? It does not tell us that what is the current state of the machine right now. For example, we all have, let's say we buy two same computers, right? They, they have exactly same specification and they have exact same hardware and software and we run same software on both these machines. And in one of the software, let's say somebody interacts with the machine. Then we know that the internal state of the machine will be different, right? So for both these machines, internal states is different. So this is exactly what we are, are dealing with this, with the configuration. It's a kind of a snapshot. It tells us overall picture of a machine when it is running, when it is doing some configuration. Yeah? Yes, sir. Thank okay. You. Any other question?
No, sir. Okay. Anyone else has any other question? Um, sir, uh, I just have one question which is not related to the class, but uh, when will we have our next quiz? That's a very good question. We will have our next quiz next week. Um, yes, it, will, it, it will be next week. So I will okay. I will tell you either it will be on Tuesday or Thursday. Okay, I will sir. So whatever we cover today will be included in the quiz? Uh, whatever that we covered after the context free grammars, right? So in theory machines. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> so we have been talking about Turing machine and um, so let us revise a few things. And as we know that Turing machine is a general purpose uh, computation model and it can solve a lot of other problems which uh, the other primitive models that we discussed which were simple finite automata or push down automata, uh, they could not solve, right? <clears throat> Uh, for, for those models, we use steering machines, TM model. So import, it is important to know uh, that what kind of problems that we can talk about uh, when we are talking about uh, steering machines. And uh, I mean, is it possible to solve each and every kind of computational problem or we are limiting ourselves to certain kind of computational problem. So computational problems can be broadly Categorized in two categories, for example. One are the decision problems, and the other are the optimization problems. For example, whatever that you do on computers, it falls on one of these two things. Okay. Uh, for example, you must have done some programming data structure courses or maybe some other computer science courses. Uh, so every time you, you write some program, you, you write that program to do certain tasks, right? So we can say that that task is basically a kind of optimization. For example, if I say that given a list of numbers, sort these numbers in some particular order, then this is an optimization problem. So optimization problem or every other problem which is not a decision problem is a kind of problem where you need solution. While decision problems are those problems where a solution to the problem is always in two possible ways, either yes answer or no answer. Like sometimes you call it true answer, sometimes you call it false answer, or one answer or zero answer, or accept or reject. So these are the two Boolean um, kind of answer, which we expect from decision problems. Okay, so let, let me tell you uh, one problem from two different lenses. So for example, I say given an array or a list, given an array A of N numbers, for example, I ask sort A in ascending order. Okay, so this is question number one. Question number two, is A sorted in ascending order? So these are two different kinds of questions. So the first kind of question which asks us to do something. It asks us to perform some computation and give a result, right? For example, A could be any array of n numbers. The first kind of question, which, which I've written over here is question one, it says that given this array, sort it, right? So this is, the sorting is the objective. So this is a kind of optimization problem. While the second kind of question, which is that given an array, I can ask, is the array that is given to us is already is sorted or not, right? So we know that both these questions require different kind of time complexity. It takes much more time to perform question one or to solve question one than to solve question number two. 
right? So most of the time when we talk about Turing machines, we only concern with decision problems. Okay. Whenever we talk about Turing machines, we talk about decision problems and not just Turing machines. Whenever we talk about computation theory in general, we talk about decision problems. We do not talk about optimization problem most of the time. So unless it is explicitly specified <clears throat> that a certain problem is an optimization problem, <clears throat> if it just says problem, then we should assume that this is a decision problem. And this is for a very good reason, actually. The reason is that, that we know <clears throat> that if we can solve and uh, if we can solve a decision problem, then we can always solve an optimization problem. So, and, and sometimes it is not the, it's not clear that if we can solve this problem that, I mean, it is possible, but it's, it's problematic. So, so we do not concern ourselves with optimization problems most of the time, whenever we talk about uh, computation theory or theory of automata or, or similar courses of, of the nature. So we talk about this. <clears throat> so it is important to, to distinguish these kinds of So whenever we would create a Turing machine over here, for example, in this course, and sometimes, most of the times, you would consider a Turing machine as this block diagram, and you would say that this is a Turing machine M, and then we would describe what this M does here, right? And we would say this is an input X, and this the answer is accept or reject, right? In most simple terms, this is exactly what we would do. So when we say accept and reject, and we talk about decision problems. So the only kind of problem that we would be dealing with during machines in this course are basically the membership question. Okay, and what do we mean by membership questions? Uh, so for example, provided a language L, we do not know how this L is defined. Suppose this there is a language L. Now if this L is a language, we know that L contains strings, right? L contains strings because a language is basically a set of strings. So L is a language means L is a set of strings or it contains strings. So for example, imagine that L is a set, L is a language which, which is sigma star. We do not know what is the sigma star. We can make our sigma as just zero one. For, for just, I mean, to simplify things, imagine that sigma is, is just here. Then L is a language which is sigma. So, what kind of strings we have in all strings over zero, one are in L. All possible binary strings that we can think of are in L, right? Right? So for every possible binary string that you can think of, it is in, right? Similarly, I can define a language A to be a language that consists of zero n, one n, such that n is greater than or equal to zero, right? So what is this language A? A is a language that contains, uh, which is, for example, if we again fix sigma to be zero one, then A is a language that contains strings of the form zeros and ones, such that number of zeros is same as number of ones and all the zeros come before all the ones, right? Now, for any arbitrary string X, any arbitrary string X, which is over some alphabet, okay? Which is over some alphabet, because we know that this, whatever string that we will take, it will be over some alphabet. So the question that we ask from the Turing machine is that is the membership question, that whether this X belongs to the language A or not. Okay, and we know that the answer would either be yes or it would be no. And we would see that, that it is possible to, to solve this problem with just two possible answers, yes or no. Okay, any questions so far? <clears throat> no, sir. No, okay. Sir. So, so we, we just need answers of the two times, right? Yes answers and no answers. 
and this yes answer corresponds that this this string x belongs to the language a or this is string x and the no answer corresponds to that this string does not belong to the language right so and that turns out to be just the membership query or the membership questions right so we would be solving membership queries right and this membership queries have very good relationship with decision problems okay <clears throat> now with this we turn our attention to two different kinds of languages that we uh, encountered last time uh, one was the turing recognizable languages and the other was turing decidable languages So let me explain what are these two types of languages in a little bit detail, and then we will continue our discussion. So when we talk about Turing machines, suppose there is some Turing machine M and it receives an input X. There is a possibility that X belongs to the language. And suppose the language is F. So there is a possibility that this X belongs to the language. And in that case, uh, the Turing machine should answer yes, or it should say, except right yes or accept. in some case for example if x does not belong to the language it we assume that it would say no or reject right but we have seen previously that it is possible it is possible that in some cases Turing machine cannot answer, okay? It cannot answer, which means that it went into an infinite loop. So it went into an infinite loop. As an outside observer, we cannot figure out that what is the situation because we cannot see a Turing machine in execution. And by just looking at one of the configuration of of the Turing machine, we cannot decipher if it is the case that it is an infinite loop because this, the size of the infinite loop, loop could be anything uh, that we can imagine, right? It doesn't have to be just a loop of two states or three states. Uh, it could be anything. Or it is possible that there is no infinite loop, but the input itself is too complicated for the machine to, do, to give us any answer, right? So with this, there's a third possibility and that is the machine is stuck. It cannot do anything. Now, the question arises, that is this a third possible output or it is just one possible scenario that the steering machine can go in? The thing is that it is not one possible output because when a machine says yes, we know that it says yes or accept by explicitly going into Q accept, right? Because every Turing machine has two specific states, one is for accepting and one for rejecting. And once the machine enters in any one of these states, it stops computation. It immediately stops everything and it just produces the output. Or just being the machine, or just that the machine being in that state means that uh, we should take whatever the state is as the output. If it is an accept state, we say that it is accepted or yes answer. <clears throat> if it is in the no or reject state, the answer is not. But if the machine goes into an infinite loop, or if it is too complicated for the machine to um, carry on a, a computation and, and to produce an answer, we would not have any clue that what is happening, right? So for example, we know that from our experience in past that when we write programs, uh, some programs take more time to arrive at a conclusion or at an answer than other programs. For example, if I say that write a program uh, that adds let's say 10 numbers, then you know it's very quick. If I give you 10 numbers, your program will add those numbers in, in a fraction of a second and it, it will produce an answer. Now, adding 10 matrices will definitely take more time. 
and also depending on the size of the matrix, right? Let's say if I have 10 matrices of size five by five, it will take some time, but if I increase the size of the matrices from five by five to 20 by 20, and I have 10 such matrices, and, matrices, and I ask you to add all these 10 matrices of size 20 by 20, then you know that it will take substantially more time than adding just 10 simple integer numbers, right? So some prob uh, problems require more time than other pro uh, problems to solve, right? And that is basically a part of the third uh, and third part of the course that we will discuss uh, later on uh, in, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but before we go there, we know that some problems take more time. So when the machine is in the stuck state or it, it cannot produce an output, is it because that it cannot produce an answer? That it is already in an infinite loop? Or is it because the computation is too complex and it is taking a lot of time? And once, I mean, we are in such a confused, confused state, right? So we cannot decide what is the case here uh, because we do not know when do we think that this is the time that if it is passed, then we should assume that it is an infinite loop because it is possible that the machine may take five minutes or maybe 10 minutes or maybe one hour or maybe five hours. So we do not know what time we should expect uh, that this machine would produce an answer. So this is a third possible scenario in which some Turing machines may enter. That is rather than saying yes or no, they will, know, they will not provide any answer. So this is a valid possibility. So what to do with these cases? So we say that all such languages, for all such languages, L, such that it is possible that the machine might go into an infinite loop or it get, get stuck inside. We call those languages Turing recognizable languages. Okay, and for all those languages L for which it is possible to construct a machine which never goes into an infinite loop, which always produces a yes answer or a no answer are called Turing recyclable languages. Is the difference clear to all of you? So, but how would we know that any particular language will not leave the VM to be stuck at any point? That's a very good question. And, and the thing is, we will see later on that how we can figure it out, okay? For example, if I say L is a language, suppose L is a language and I find a string X, and for this string X, I cannot, I cannot, I mean, for, uh, I cannot construct any Turing machine for this L such that it tells me whether it, it, it will give you give me and give me a yes answer or no answer. If it is possible, if it is the case that this means this language is in L. Okay, this language is in. Sorry, this language is the Turing recognizable and not Turing design. And we will see later on that it is possible to, to figure out that there's, uh, there are certain results which we can apply uh, to figure out whether a language is in, if, if a language is decidable or recognized. Okay. So as a first attempt, for example, whenever we receive a language, our first uh, attempt is to, to see that whether that language is decidable or not. If it is decidable, fine. If it is not decidable, or if we cannot figure out that it's not decidable, we go for the other one, which is the Turing recognizable. And it is possible that when we go in that direction, it is indeed a Turing recognizable language. Even though that is not just a, that is not a proof because we were not able to construct Turing, Turing decided, that's not a proof. Uh, but if we can prove it, then we would definitely know that it is uh, Turing recognizable. Okay, so what we need to do, for example, if there is any, any language L, we say that there exists a string X. For example, this is over some sigma. Then we say there exists a string X over sigma star, such that no Turing machine gives no answer. Okay, if we can come up with such a proof, we know that it is Turing recognized. Yes, and that's Sorry. exactly, Yes. So if no TM gives no answer, wouldn't that mean that it's a Turing decidable? 
just a second. No, it means that it's during recognizable. So because it, it will never go no answer, right? But we do not know whether X belongs to the language or X does not belong to the language. We do not know. When Sorry, it says yes, says we know that it is L. Yes, yes, go ahead. But a decidable languages never give a no answer, right? Okay, so there is some problem with the wording. Yeah, okay. Sorry, yes. so no TM Okay, so let me rephrase it. Let me rephrase it. There's some issue. So suppose there's some language L over some alphabet and there's some string X on some C plus star. If I can prove that there is no Turing machine. Which will tell me if X does not belong to language L, then L is Turing that Okay, I think that's that's correct now. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, so there is a question. So what is the relationship between Turing recognizable and Turing decidable? The relationship is very simple and that is every Turing decidable language is Turing recognizable language. Right? For example, let's say L is a Turing decidable language. Suppose Turing L is a Turing decidable language. It means that there must exist a machine, Turing machine M, such that for every string X that is provided to it, it either accepts or it rejects, right? So let me write these on, on the arrows. So there exists in accepts or rejects, right? Now I say that every Turing decidable language is Turing recognizable language. So if L is a Turing decidable language, we know that such a thing exists. So what you would do, you put all of that into another Turing machine in prime, okay? And put this accept as the accept, and that's it, forget about reject. Then we know that this M prime recognizes L. M decides L while M prime recognizes L, right? So recognizes and decides are now connected with during recognizable and during decidable. Is this thing clear? So every Turing decidable language is Turing recognizable, but not the other. Is this thing clear? So this is a simulation argument. We are simulating a Turing recognizable language using a Turing decidable language because M is a Turing decidable language and we are trying to simulate a Turing recognizable language using a Turing decidable language. And we are not doing anything. We are just putting a, a bigger or a, or a different Turing machine on top of it. So we say that machine M is now part of this M prime. And what we do is just connect the accept of M prime with the except of M and, and do not connect the reject of M to anything. Now there is no reject here, right? There is no output as the reject. So if a string belongs to the, to the language, it will accept. And if the language, if the string does not belong to M, it will never produce an answer, right? Because it will just be stuck inside. So because M, M prime does not give us an answer. Is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A question from your last example. Okay. 
Which Sir, one uh, is it? The, the one that you just did before this one. Okay. Yes. Sir, if there exists no uh, during machine, then how is the language during recognizable? Yes, very good question. Uh, <clears throat> there is no Turing decider. There are Turing recognizer. So, so Turing recognizable languages. So Turing recognizable language gives us some uh, some other words. For example, it gives us recognizer. It gives us the word recognize. Right. In Turing, decide will languages give us decider and decide among other uh, other words for example i say that a turing machine m recognizes a language l okay so whenever i say that turing machine m recognizes the language l it means that it gives me a yes answer or accept accepts a string whenever that string belongs to L, right? So what is the meaning of this one? It means that if X belongs to the language L, M accepts X. If X does not belong to the language L, M does not produce any answer. does not and may not both can apply. Okay, so if M recognizes L, it means that whenever the string belongs to the language, M would accept it. And whenever the string does not belong to the language, then M does not or may not produce any answer or any output. Well, on the other hand, if I say that M decides L, it means that if X belongs to the language, M accepts it. If X does not belong to the language, M rejects X. Okay, so this is the definition of decides and recognize. So these recognizes and decides come from Turing recognizable and Turing decides. Does that clear the confusion? Okay. So if we, when we say that it is Turing recognizable, it doesn't mean that we cannot we cannot even do the first part. We can do first part. Whenever the string belongs to the language, it will produce a yes answer or accept answer. It will not produce or it may not produce an answer when the string does not belong to the language. And that is where the problem is. Again, again, can can you talk louder? This is basically the property of the language. This is the property of the language. Some languages are uh, such that for, it is possible for us to create deciders. And for some languages, it is impossible to create this idea. It is the structure of the language. And that's exactly kind of question we dealt with in, in the first week that we had finite automata. And then we saw that finite automata can, can accept certain kind of languages, but it failed on some other kind of language. And that's exactly the problem that we face even with Turing machine. So it is the nature of the language itself. The languages are such that for some, we can create deciders. For some, we cannot create deciders. And it is not our inability to create. It is because the nature of the language. And there is at least one language that we know uh, and we will talk about for which we cannot, we, we even cannot create a recognizer. Okay, and that is the most fun part of this book. Is this clear? So whenever we say that, whenever I would say in this course or when you read the book or notes or anything or an exam, when it says that 
M is a Turing machine that decides the language L. And suppose there is another instance which says that M1 or M prime is a machine that recognizes a language A. So you should know that what is meant by recognize and decide. And that's exactly what I said uh, when we talk about finite automata, then we have to be sure, we, we have to be clear about the words recognize and accept. Yes, please go ahead. Sorry, sir. Uh, so in a recognizer, we only have one answer, which is accept. Yes. Okay. I mean, it's not that we only have one answer. There, there are always two possible outputs. Uh, but the thing is that the second output may never be used. Okay. So for example, I can write a program like if uh, true, then it's a print, hello world. Else print, bye. We know that program will never write bye. Even if we put it in, uh, in, a, in, a, in an infinite loop, it will keep printing hello world, it will never print by, right? Because it will never come to this point. So, so there is a possibility that the Turing machine M, which recognizes language L, will have two possible outputs, yes and no, uh, for some string X, but it may never go in that direction. So that's why I said, does not or may not. So it is possible that it sometimes give you no answer, uh, but it is not necessary that it will give you no answer all the time. Okay. okay. So there is no guarantee that it will give you no answer all the time. Okay. Sir. Okay. Uh, so have you taken any course on algorithms so far? So we did introduction to programming and then we did okay. data structures. So, so design design analysis of algorithms. You haven't done design analysis, of algorithms, right? Okay, when you will so do design in analysis of algorithms in, in six semester, that is I think in, in spring uh, next year, uh, then we will see a kind of problems which we solve using randomized algorithms. And over there, we will actually connect them with non-determinism in many things and we will see that it is possible that some algorithms do not produce any output so for that we have a connection with, with the turing recognizable kind of thing anyway uh, that's for the six semester <clears throat> anyway so so i think we are we are sure that turing decidable language languages are a subset of turing recognizable languages right so for example if we create a set of all possible languages which are in Turing decidable languages, or which are in the set Turing TD, and we create a set of all Turing recognizable language, then this set is definitely a subset of Of course. Uh, okay, so let's move on. If there is there are no questions, then we can do a couple of examples, and then uh, we will just talk about some other uh, interesting mathematical. So let us, uh, let's say we have a language L and this is our famous, I mean, this is our favorite language. Okay. And the question is, can we construct a Turing machine for this? Okay. Now, when I say construct a Turing machine, there are many, uh, what is DAA? Design analysis of algorithm. Okay, fine. So whenever we uh, construct Turing machine, there are multiple possible ways to construct it. One possible way is a graphical version, which looks very similar to a finite automata or uh, a pushdown automata. Right? It has it has circular states and arrows and, and transactions uh, transitions on on uh, transition labels on. Trans I mean things and, and, and like that. So one is graphical version. The other version is just the descriptive version, which, which I will explain what is this description, descriptive version. And the third possible way is using the formal way of defining what are the states and what are the uh, the starting state and 
accepting state and final state or reject state and transition function and everything. So that is the complete, I mean, um, formal way. Okay. Sometimes we go with this one. And most of the other times you will go with the description. Because it is much easier to describe a Turing machine in a descriptive manner rather than going a graphical form or a formal form. And it will be clear that why it is like this. But anyway, so let us see, we have this language L. This is our favorite language. <clears throat> so let us see why is zero and one. <clears throat> so let us uh, construct a graphical Turing machine for this. Okay. So, so, so you, before, yes. I just have one question. Um, is it possible that a regular language, is it possible for us to make a TM for a regular language as well? Of course we can. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Now, now suppose this, this language L, which we have here, uh, we know that how we, we can construct, we, we cannot construct push down, or we cannot construct finer automata, but we can construct push down right? So if we have a stack, we can construct it. Now, now, since we have a Turing machine, so Turing machine doesn't have a stack, but it has this property that it can move the head of the machine in any direction, any number of times, right? Uh, so we don't need, we actually do not need, uh, we actually do not need um, a stack for this. And this is the first example that we did when we started talking about Turing machine. So we know, we know a good idea about that how this uh, this language how how the steering machine works. So, for example, if we receive any input which consists of zeros and ones, what we would do we start with the zero and we assume that the first is zero. And whenever we see a zero, we cross that zero, go all the way to the right direction till we find first one. When we find the first one, we cross that one as well, go all the way till to the left, find the last zero. Once we find the zero, cross it go all the way to the right and find the first one and cross it and do this uh, to and fro motion till we do not find any zeros. Once you do not find any zero, try to go all the way to the right hand side and see if there are any ones. If there are any ones, it means that it can, this string contains more ones than zeros, so we should reject it. And if we find a blank uh, element on, on the tape, the string is accepted and so on. There are some other a particular thing. So let me uh, draw the steering machine. So we start with Q0. Q0 is the starting state. We go to Q1 after Q0 by this transition. This transition says that when the input symbol read by the machine pointed by the head of the steering machine is zero, then make it X or just cross the zero, okay? and go to the right on the tape. So when we start Turing machine, we assume, we assume that whatever the string that is input to the machine is written over here. So let's say X is the input and X consists of X1, X2, X, uh, K. Then the first K blocks are written with this, these X Ks, and then we have blank symbols. And this is our assumption, right? And when we start uh, the Turing machine, when we start the Turing machine, uh, the head of the Turing machine is pointing to the to the first symbol or the first block of the Turing machine. So we say that if you re, if you see a zero, put X, okay, cross it, and move to the right direction. So R means right direction, and go to state Q1. Okay. Now, if someone some someone can argue that what if it reads one rather than zero? So we would not show that transition uh, transition because Every transition which is not shown here leads to an error state or to, to reject state, okay? Once we are in Q1, what we need to do? Once we are in Q1, what we need to do? Whenever, whatever zero you read, just ignore it. Don't do anything and just keep going to, to the right. There's one more transition, which I will come back here. I'm not writing it right now, but we will come back. When the machine is in Q1, if it sees zero, then it just ignores all the zeros and keep going to write. If it finds one, what it does, it produces, it 
replaces this one with y and goes to, to the left-hand side, okay? And moves the machine to Q2, okay? And in this case, if it finds any zero, then it does not do anything and it keeps going to 2L. There's one more transition, which I will come back, <clears throat> okay? Now, if we are going to the left-hand side, left direction, then there is a possibility that we will hit this X because we just wrote X, right? So we will hit that person, uh, that, that log. And if the machine reads X on the head, then what it does, it does not do anything and just moves to the right. When it sees X, just comes back. It goes to the right side and keeps doing, okay? Over here, there are two more transactions, which I did not show, and which is if it finds Y, it does not change anything to the Y and keeps moving to the, to the left-hand side. And in this process, if it finds a Y, it does not change anything to the Y and keeps moving to the right. Now over here, when it is in Q0, it means that we were successful in finding first zero and finding one corresponding one on, on the other side. Now we can find a second zero and third zero and so on and so forth. But at one point we'll come, at one point we will see that there are no more zeros. We will only see Y's and X, X's, right? So if it finds Y, it goes to Q3. Okay, when it finds Y, it does not change anything. It just goes to the right hand side. And it, it moves this, the state of the machine into Q3. And in Q3, if it reads Y, it does not change, it does not do anything. It just keeps moving to the right hand side. And over here, if it sees blank symbol, then it just changes anything and goes to the right hand side to Q4, and that is the And this is the Turing machine, which decides the language N. Any question? So let, let us run some small string. Let's say we pass 0, 0, 1, 1, okay? So the head of the machine will be on, on zero. So it sees a zero here. So let me change it. So it sees zero, right? If it's zero, it sees zero, it, it moves, it changes zero to X and moves to the right hand side, right? So it will change. So I will write the next thing here. So it will change X, zero, one, one, and move the head to zero, right? And now the machine is in Q1. So it was in Q0, now the machine is in Q1. When the machine is in Q1, it sees a zero. Then what, did, what does it do? It doesn't do anything, it just moves to the right-hand side. So it will keep moving to the right-hand side till it finds one. Once it finds a one, what it does, it replaces this, this one with Y and go to, to the left-hand side, okay? So when it finds one, so let's say we, we would be Q1, X0, 1, 1. Now when, when we are here, it, it would replace this one with Y. So it becomes X0, L1, and, it, and the head will move to the left. And the machine will go to Q2, right? And once the machine is in Q2, it will keep reading zeros and go to the left hand side. Now it is zero, so it will not change anything to the zero. It will move to the right hand side, uh, to the left hand side. Once the machine goes to here, now we will apply this transaction, which is X, X, R. So it sees an X, which is on the tape. So it will not change anything to X, but it will go to the right hand direction and move to Q0. So what we will see here, we will be in Q0. It will be X zero L one and, and this one be, this one will be here, right? Now, once we are in zero, it will act like that will be started. So this zero will be converted into X. And once we finish, we would be again in Q zero, X, X, L one, and the head will be here. So shouldn't it L be Y instead of L? Oh, sorry, not L, Y. Sorry for that. Okay, so machine will be in Q0, 
first two zeros must have been converted into x's and the the ones have been converted into y's and the machine is pointing to the y so it will read y when it reads y it does not change anything it goes to the right hand direction so it will come here and it will go to state q3 in the state q3 it will keep reading y as many times it it sees and once it finishes reading y it will see a blank symbol so there's a blank symbol over here and this blank symbol signifies that the string is accepted this belongs to the language now you can try it on a string which contains let's say 001113 three ones rather than two ones sir uh, so we would know that it, it will not work yes sir what if the value of n is 0 what if the value of n is very good question we will come to that one. just give me few seconds okay sir okay. uh there is some outsider in this meeting he is sending me the direct message okay okay so if there is any uh, weird activity going on just send me um the name of that person as a private message and i will uh, i will keep them out anyway so if a string belongs to the language we know that it will be accepted and if this language if the string does not belong to the language we know that it will not be accepted okay now we said that we want to recognize as a language which is 0 n 1 n n is greater than equal to 0 and this machine cannot accept empty string right this machine cannot accept empty string so there are two possibilities that is let us say we modify this language n and we say that this is not um n is greater than 0 it is n is greater than equal to 1 and for this it will work uh, but let's say we insist that you know we want for n greater than equal to 0 then what we can do let's say l is 0 n 1 n n is greater than equal to 1 right in this case what you can do you can have let's say p0 a new state even before uh, q0 starts and over here you say that empty okay, or m rather than we say there is blank and we go to write we go to state which is accepted okay and from here we can start so this will become uh this will not become anything so this is just one additional state that we need to take care of and then we uh, construct the machine so so everything else which is q0 will start from here right so this becomes uh, so this will become q0 and we will come here um if there is some x0 we will just don't do anything q0 prime so whatever it is or don't care don't care just move to left direction this will be all things so we have to make some modification to the to the machine such that it, it it can now recognize this empty string as well okay yeah so the current existing machine this machine cannot accept empty string it cannot work for n equal to 0 excuse me sir yes uh is it possible that by looking at this tm uh, can we figure out if l is turing recognizable or turing decidable um is it possible to answer this question by just looking at i think no it is not possible okay sir and i i don't know i 
I haven't, I never thought about it. So I, I don't know the right answer. Um, the thing is that, so all those transitions which are, which we are not showing will take this machine into reject state, right? So in that case, yes. it is decider. Right? Yeah, so I, I think it's not possible right now, but this, this is decided. So by just looking at a Turing uh, machine graphical version, maybe it's not possible. I'm not sure. I, I don't know the answer. Okay, so I'll think know, about it. I'll think thing, about it. This, yeah, thank you. Uh, in the previous TM, um, it's not going to accept, it's, it's not going to work on an empty string, right? Yes, yes. And cannot be equal to zero in that language. Yeah, so we have to modify it. So it has to be any any greater than one greater than equal to. that's a mistake it has to be greater than equal to one not greater than equal to two you cannot okay, recognize them. okay so let us let us say we have another language and this time our sigma is abc okay. and this time the language is all a's some i copies of a's uh, j copies of b's in A copies of C, okay? such that um, all I, J, K are at least one and I times J is equal to K. So what are some strings which are in this language? For example, A, B, C is in the language because there's one A, one B, so one times one is one, so there's one C. A, B, B, C, C is also in the language because there's one A and two Bs. One times two is two. There must be two C, right? So for example, A, A, B, B, B. This is also in, in the language because we have two copies of A's, three copies of B's, so two times three is six. So we have six copies of such C. So all such strings will be in this lang language. For example, A, A, B, B, C, C is not in the language, right? Because two A's, two B's means that it should be four C's, but we have just two C's. MT is not in, in, in the language, why? Because all I, J, and K must be greater than or equal to one. There must be at least one A, one B, one C. It is impossible to have just BC, right? So BC is not in the language because there is no A. It is impossible to have AC, right? It is impossible to have AB, right? And any other string which is not in the order is also not in the language. So let us construct a Turing machine for this uh, language with descript uh, descriptive word, right? So let me write the language here again. So I say L is a language, which consists of AI, BJ, CK, uh, such that I, J, K are greater than or equal to one, and I times J is equal to K, okay? So we will construct a Turing machine M, and this is on, um, description with with description. So we say that Turing machine M on input string W. So we would describe what will happen when this W, which is a string, which is over sigma star. So our sigma is ABC. So whenever we receive some sorry, whenever this machine this machine M receives a string W over sigma star, it will do follow up. Okay. So, what it will do is step number one scan the input from left to right. Okay. To determine whether it is a member of A star, B star, C star. And over here, star is not just a uh, star, it means that at least one A, one B, one C. Okay, if it is that it contains A's, then B's, then C's, fine. If it does not contain any of the A's, B's, and C's, reject, okay? Reject otherwise. Step number one is very simple. So in other words, somebody say that we are writing, actually writing an algorithm. So we are writing an algorithm. So we say that just scan the whole string from left to right 
and just check if all A's, uh, just check if the string is in the form of A's, B's, and C's. Uh, there is no A after B, or there is no A after C, or there is no C before B or before A, and so on and so forth, right? So they are, uh, the individual characters of the string are in, in the general form, that A's, B's, and C's, right? If it is, if there is any discrepancy, just switch it. Step number two, once we are done, return the head to the left. Okay. So once we are sure that the string is, is in the proper format, just return the head to the first position. And how we can return the head to the first position? So whatever position you are, so whatever you read, A's, B's, C's, just ignore them and keep going to the left till it is the end of the string. This, this is the beginning of, of the string. Once it is the beginning of the string, then the head will point to the first block, okay? Now what? Step number three. So now when the machine is in this, uh, Okay, so step number three. So once the machine is on uh, the left-hand side, we know that the machine must be reading A. So if it is reading A, then cross off an A. There might be multiple A, but cross off the first A that you find. And scan to the right. Okay until B occurs. That is until the first B is found. When the B is found, we need to shuffle between Bs and Cs. Okay, shuffle Bs and Cs. And every time we see a B, we cross it, then we move to the, to, to the right and we have to find C. Once we find a C, we cross it, we come back, find a B, cross it, then go right, find a C, cross, keep crossing B's and C's until all B's are, are crossed. Once all B's are crossed, what we need to do? Once all B's are crossed, what we need to do? We would restore, so, so now, <clears throat> if at this position, if it is this, if, if this position, if there are not enough Bs, we would reject because now we have crossed off all the Bs, but for every B, there must be at least one C. But suppose there was uh, some C for which there is no B. It means that there are fewer number of Bs than Cs. And uh, I mean, there are fewer numbers of Cs than, than Bs. So it means that we have to reject, right? If it is not the case, then we would go to step number four. And the step number four is restore all Bs. Okay, and repeat step three. Okay, and if in this process, if all is have been crossed, crossed off, determine whether all C's also have been crossed off. If yes, except otherwise, So uh, I will stop at this point. We will take a break. And once we come back from the break, I will explain it further. And I, we will do some examples and see that how it works. Okay? So we'll follow this. Okay. So 
So let's take a break of let's say uh, 10 minutes, 10 15 minutes. So let's come back at 7 45. Is everyone back? Yes, sir. So let me share my screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> So, so I, I would explain this uh, this algorithm. So before I explain, let's take an example. Let's say we have a string A, A, B, B, C, C, C. So the step number one of this algorithm was that scan from left to right and check if the string is of the form of A star, B star, C star. That is, we just check if, if this string consists of A's, B's, and C's, right? And since this string contains only A's, B's, and C's, and all A's before B's and all B's before C's, uh, so we pass that, that step. Step number two is that once you are done with that, reach to the first, first position, index zero or index one or, or block one of the Turing machine or whatever you want to call it. And once you find an A, cross it. And once you cross an A, go all the way till the right direction and find the B. Once you find the B, cross it and go all the way right and cross a C. Okay. Once you find a C, come back and cross a B. Okay. Go, go to the right and cross a C. Come back and now you do not see any B, right? There are no Bs here. And since there are no Bs here, so what we would do, you would come to A and go to this B and restore all the Bs. So you would have A, B, B, C, C, C. Sorry, uh, how many Cs we, sh we should have? So two C's are canceled, one A is canceled. Okay. Now we are at this position. When we are looking at A, so So now we are looking at an A. So we cross it. Go to the right. We will cross a B. Once we cross a B, we will find a C to cross it. Sorry, it has to be four. You find a C to cross it, come back, find a B, then cross it. Now we do not find any Bs. So what we would do, we would restore all the Bs. So we have A cross, A cross, B, B, C cross. Okay. At this point, we do not find any A's which are uncrossed. Okay. There's some B uncrossed, that's fine. Then we will go all the way here and find if there are, any un there are C's which are uncrossed. Since there is no C which is uncrossed, so therefore this string is accepted. So let's try one more time. Let's say we have A, A, B, B, and C, 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 C. So two A's, three B's, and six C's. Two A's. Three Bs and six Cs. And we know that this string is in the language. So what we would do, first of all, we would cross A, then come to the right and, and cross B. And for every B that we cross, we cross C. For this B, we cross this C. For this B, we cross this C. Now, there are some Cs, but there are no Bs, right? So in this position, what we would do, we would restore all the Bs. So we would come to this position. Come to this position. Now we find an A, so cross it. And for every B that we find, cross a C. 
for every b that we find cross a c for every b that we find cross a c once all b's have been crossed there are no more b's so what we would do we would restore b so we would be in this position we will come to this we will we will try to find some a since there is no a which is not crossed so we will go to the right and see if there is any c which is not crossed when there is no c which is not crossed therefore it is also accepted now think about a string which is not in the language for example a a or b b in c c this is not in the language because the number of c's must be four not not uh, two let's say it make it three it is still not in the, in the language So for this a, we will cross this b and cross this c, then cross this b and cross this c. We are fine. So the next position would be so these two c's are crossed. The first a is crossed, and the head will point to the second a. Now we we cross this a, cross this b, cross this c. We find this b, but for this b there is no c here. Right? So reject. Okay. In this case. there are not enough c's so therefore we reject there is no limit on how many a's and b's we should have the only limit is that number of c's must be same as the number of a's times number of b's if there are more number of c's then we would be left with some c's which are not crossed and and for that there is no uh, corresponding a therefore it is rejected and if there are lesser number of fewer number of c's we will not able to find the c which we should cross Therefore, we should reject. Now, if we go come back to this uh, this algorithm, I think it it should make any sense. It should make sense. Uh, this is exactly what I showed as an example, and this is just the description of. Yeah. Is this in clear? Yes, sir. Any question? Sir, uh, someone someone from the class named Anas is wanting to join the meeting. Can you open the meeting for a while? Just a second. Let me unlock. Okay, sir. Okay, it is unlocked. Uh, anyone can join. Uh, I will lock after few. Okay. Any any questions? No, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Uh, so I think now we have some good idea about how Turing machines can be described. So we have graphical manner, we have descriptive manner, formalism, and the third one is the formal manner. And the formal manner is very easy. Uh, so what you do, you you have a transition function and you create a table. And exactly what we did, we push on automaton for automata. You would write down that transition table. That's it. So if it if everything is clear, we will move to If you call multi-tape Turing machine, okay. So what is multi-tape Turing machine? A multi-tape Turing machine is a Turing machine in which we have more than one tape available. Okay. So, so the so the traditional Turing machine is a Turing machine. In which we have one thing, right? And the head and one head head of the machine, which points to the to the first knob in the Turing machine, and this is the Turing machine, right? So the multi-tape Turing machine is a Turing machine in which we have multiple tapes, not one tape, but multiple tapes. Not two, not three, maybe three, four. So we say that we have eight. So we have k tapes, and we have k heads. Okay, everything else remains the same. So the only change that we will have would be in the transition function. So now, since there are k heads and k tapes, so every transition requires that it, the machine might be reading k symbols at a time, right? So, so the machine could be in any state. But it can be reading k symbols. Now, once it reads those k symbols, then it can go to some state, any state, 
it can write anything to those A heads, or it may decide to go not write anything on one of the dates, two of two dates, or some of the dates. And it can also go to left, right, or it may decide not to move the head. Now we have the third, third possibility, L for left, so that the head moves to the left, left hand side. R for the right hand side, and S stay put. Okay, it may decide not to move. So, for example, after some steps, this head moves to the to to this position, and this head moves to let's say here. And this head is, let's say, somewhere here. And after one step, machine decides to move uh, this head to this position. So it comes here. It is stay put. It, it keeps the head number two at this position and, and some other head. Now we have three possibilities that it can move to left, it can move to right, it can stay put. Okay. So how would the transition look like? Yes. So the heads of each of these steps uh, are not synchronized, right? They can move. Yeah, they can move here. separately. Yeah, any any okay. head can move in any direction. It can move to left or right, or it may decide not to move, depending on the language and the situation. Okay. So how would a transition okay. look like here? So we would say that the transition requires that, let's say the machine is in Q1. Okay, and since there are K tapes. So let's say A1 is the symbol that is on A1, A2 is the symbol that is on A2, and so on AK. So these are the K symbols that the machine is taking. Now, as a result, what will happen, the machine may decide to you go to some J, QJ, okay? It may decide that this A1 be replaced with B1, A2 may be replaced with B2, and so on. And it may decide to move the first set to left, for example, to right and something. Something. Okay. Is this in clear? So, so the big question. Why? Why do we need a Turing machine with multiple tapes? Why do we need a Turing machine with yeah? Why do we need Turing machine? And is there any benefit of having a Turing machine with multiple? So these are the questions that we will try to answer. So if you want to make a copy of a string, can we use a multi-tape DM for that? Yes. So so some uses. The uses of multi-tape Turing machines are that since now we have more space to work on. Now suppose now look at the same uh, languages that we have so far recognized. For example, uh, we recognize zero n, one n, n is greater than or equal to one, right? So this was the language. Now the entire string was on on one tape, right? Now suppose that we have two tapes or three tapes or multiple tapes. What we could do, we know that we have all the zeros and then uh, all the ones and so on. What we would do as the machine starts, we will skip everything, okay, till it finds a zero. As soon as finds one, we will start copying the ones here, okay. So once we have copied all the ones, we know that the first head will be here, the second head will be here. What we would do, we will bring this head, we will bring this head. To the first one, okay. We will bring this head to the first one, or if you don't want, that's perfectly fine. And for every zero we read, we cross here. Every zero we read, we cross here. For every zero we read, we cross, here. right? And when we and we know that when we will find the last zero, we will find the last. One. If we find a, a blank, if we find a one here and a blank here, it means that it's, it's perfect. So now think about the other language that we. This we recognize because the L E I uh, B J C K. Right, so we can also do the same thing. So this is the input. Keep the input as is. Create new copies. Okay, 
in, in this one, just write A's. In this one, just write B's. And in this one, just write C's. Okay. Now we don't have to go uh, to and fro again and again and again, right? So we write one A, we cross one B, we cross one C. Then we, for every B here, we, we, we cross. Then we restore B's and then do the same. So multi tape has definitely some advantages. And that advantage is our. Uh, that we can, whatever that we were doing before, now can be speed, right? So we can speed up the things that we were doing before. Now the time Sir? taken by would be less in, in this particular case. Yes. Sir, so in this, will we have an extra transition to move between the tapes? No, we don't have, well, why do we need to have a transition? So how will we? Is how... Transition is here. So now we have a stay put, right? So we say, okay, forget about tape, uh, tape number one. Stay put. The head stays put there. So whatever it is, it will not, not move. So we just keep moving. The remaining head. Sir, but now, how do we define the movement between the tapes? Why, what do you mean by movement between the tapes? So if you're, for example, in tape one, we, re we read an A and we cross it. Then we have to go to tape two to read a B and then cross it. So yeah. how do what we will happen? Okay, show okay. that? that, that. Fine. Now suppose this is the case. And we have two A's. Suppose we have already done the pre-processing and we found that there are two A's. There are three B's. And there are three C's. And not three C's. And this is blank. This is blank. This is blank. So these are the head positions. So transition will say that when the head number one is, is reading A, okay, and head number B is reading B, and the head number three is reading C, don't do anything with head number A except that cross it, cross this, cross this, move this head here and move this head here. And you, now the next transition would be, don't do whatever, whatever you were reading, just don't ignore it. And cross it, and cross it. It stays put there. Right? We move here, we move here. And... Now, if you are trying to think in terms of the graphical uh, version, then yeah, it is cumbersome. It, it will require a lot of thinking and creative processes to, to implement such a thing. Therefore, we would usually avoid a graphical method for any complicated language or any, any complicated computation. So it is better to describe the solution in terms of um, in terms of an algorithm because in algorithm we don't have to care about many things. For example, we say that uh, in the, the first tape, for every A you read in the first tape, read a B in the second tape and read a C in the second tape. And for every B that you read in the in the second tape, read a C in the second tape and keep doing it. Once every B is read in the second tape, move all all the head and then continue. Right. So it is it is easier. In terms of uh, in terms of a descriptive and algorithmic manner, rather than okay. okay, sir. Thank you. So, so there are use cases here. So use cases are. I mean, there there are other use cases. For example, you can say that I have multiple tapes, and whenever there is some input, I will not change. I will not make any changes to the input. I will just make a copy of the input to tape number two. And if I have to make some temporary changes, I will make those changes in tape number two. This way, when we will finish our computation, the input is still preserved, right? So we can utilize this input in some way. So there are some versions of the Turing machine which give some output. So when I said that we will be only interested in uh, decision problems, so the decision problems output is just yes and no, right? But that's not a completely true, I mean, side of the story. The thing is that, most of the time when we design Turing machines, yes, we are only interested in yes and no or accept reject answer, uh, but sometimes we also look at what is left behind on the tapes of the Turing machine. And what is left behind on the tape of the Turing machine is sometimes considered as the output of the Turing machine. So usually three tape Turing machines are very common in which the first tape is the input tape. The second tape is the temporary tape where we do all the computation. And tape number three is the tape where we produce the output. So once the machine goes into accept or reject, 
it also produces an output and that output can be used in some other applications in some other manner. And that output is basically, uh, that is written in, in tape number three. So multiple tape uh, tuning machines have benefits. And the first benefit is that it is easier in the sense that rather than moving uh, the head of a tuning machine again to and fro and on the same tape, uh, doing very small things, uh, we can split the tapes, we can split the input, we can divide the tapes into different things and we can, we can work on. The other benefit is that, I mean, definitely it increases the, uh, the, the efficiency of, of the algorithm or the running time of the tuning machine. It also uh, gives us an idea in, in, in way to give, uh, to take some output from, from the tuning machine. So these are some of the advantages and uh, benefits of multiple tuning machines, multi-tape tuning machines. Now, the bigger question, uh, is there anything else that we get from a multi-tape tuning machine? And we have a theorem here. And I think some of you might have guessed that what kind of theorem we would have. It says that every multi-tape tuning machine has an equivalent single tape. So this theorem is a kind of, uh, I mean, conservative in a sense that it says that everything that you can do with multiple tape tuning machine, you can also do it with a single tape. So multiple tapes do not give you any computational advantage. So whatever that you were able to compute before, you can still compute now. And whatever that you were not able to compute before, you, can, you cannot still compute. The only advantage is, is the time. Uh, but the thing is that when we talk about theory of computation, which is this part of the course, the first four or six part of the course, uh, six weeks of the course, in theory of computation, we usually discredit or disregard time. We don't care about time. It doesn't matter if it takes one second or one year. We don't care. As long as it, it, it uh, makes any sense, it does computation, we are fine. So we will come back to the time in the next part of the course, which is time complexity. But before that, we are just interested in if something is computed. So from that point of, point of view, multi-tape tuning machines have no computational advantage. So everything that can be done with single tape can be done with multi-tape. And not only that, uh, multi-tape, for every multi-tape tuning machine, you can always convert that multi-tape tuning machine into a single tape tuning machine. So there is, because there's this theorem, so this theorem says that uh, I mean, in order to see that this theorem is true, we need a proof and the proof will actually be a kind of simulation proof. So what, what kind of proof it is? So we would say that we will start with the Turing machine M uh, with multi-tapes, let's say K tapes. I'm not giving a proof right now. I'm just describing that how this proof will look like or work. So we start with the Turing machine with K tapes. And then you would say that we can simulate the steering machine with K tapes with the Turing machine with just one tape. And uh, if we can show that for every possible Turing machine, we can simulate it, it means that every multi-tape Turing machine has an equivalent single tape Turing machine. So that simulation is the main argument. So I will not cover the theorem right now, <coughs> maybe at a later point but the proof is based on simulation. Um, okay. sir? Yes. Um, is there any method to find out whether a language is during a recognizable or decidable? If there is any, what? If there is any method? To find out if a language is during recognizable or during decidable? Uh, usually there is no general algorithm for that. So mm -hmm. it's usually tough. It's a hard question. And when I say hard, it's, uh, it has its own meaning that why I'm saying it hard. And then when, when we will go to the other part of the course, we will see that there is a mathematical meaning uh, given to this hard. So it's usually a hard question, uh, whether we can we decide, can we know that um, it is impossible or possible to find a, uh, whether it's, it's using a recognizable design. 
So no, there is no general algorithm. So what we do, most of the time we come up with a, a proof of, of by contradiction. So we say that suppose this language is Turing decidable. If it is Turing decidable, then it must accept and must reject some step, right? And then we will create an argument which will create a contradiction. Uh, and we will say that it is impossible. So if it is rejecting a string, then it, it creates a contradiction. And because it creates a contradiction, so our assumption that it is uh, decidable is not wrong. And since we can at least accept what it is accepting, therefore it is during recognizable. So, so we, we, we have indirect ways to show it. There is no general algorithm to show that a language is during recognizable or during recognizable. So should we know uh, how to do that for this course? Yes, we will do. Okay, sir. Okay, we will do. Okay, any questions? And with this, we have some corollaries and that corollary is that a language is Turing recognizable. If and only if some multi tape Turing machine recognizes. Okay, so the problem is with recognition. Oh, sorry, the problem is with decidability. Recognition is, is simple. If you can construct a Turing machine, then it is recognizable. Right? So if you can construct a Turing machine which solves some problem, then by default, it is it recognizes. And the problem arises when we say it is during whether it is during decidable or not. So we will see that there are so many languages which are not during decidable, and we will see that why they are not during. And we will we will do a lot of such arguments. Okay. So how to know if we can make a Turing machine for any language or not? Yeah, that's that's a good question, but. Uh, it is like, for example, if I give you a problem and ask you to write a program for that, right? So there, there could be two op two possible outcomes. First, if you come up with and come up with the program and see that this is program which which solves this question. And the second is that you come up with a proof and say there is no algorithm which can solve the problem. There is no program which can which can solve the problem. So coming up with the first kind of solution is easier. So you try multiple things, you look at the problem, the nature or the structure of the problem, and see that if you have seen any such problem before or any similar problem before, and what were the techniques and tricks that you used to, 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 to solve such a problem, and then you come up with tricks. It's, it's more like designing a CFG or designing a push-down automata or designing a, a DFA. So, so you think about it, go to and for and, and to and fro and, and try some, some tricks and techniques and, and see that you were successful or not. In, in most of the cases, you will be successful. Uh, okay. Because whenever, we will, whenever I will give a problem in the exam, it will be such that it will have uh, an answer. Now, on the other hand, suppose I give you a problem for which there is no hearing machine. And we will see at least one problem and there are multiple other problems which we will uh, maybe Covered, uh, we will touch them, they will maybe not in depth, but we will cover at least one problem in depth. That is, um, we will see that there are problems for which we cannot even create a machine which recognizes those languages. We cannot solve it. So there is no cheating machine which exists which can solve the problem. And we will see those problems, but these are rare. I mean, when I say rare, it's it's rare in a, in a canonical, uh, conventional manner. In fact, there are many, many more languages and problems which are uh, not Turing recognized, not even Turing recognized. Forget about decidable, not even Turing recognized. Maybe infinitely more, uh, but we are only interested in some of them. Most of them usually do not come in our discussion. So with our current understanding of computer science and mathematics, uh, we will not we will not encounter most of the time. So we will only encounter some of them, and most of them are artificial in a sense that we created those problems to show that there is a certain limitation of our 
thinking about computation. So, and, and what we think about computation. So that thing we will cover when we talk about the limits of computation. So we already have seen limits of various different computation models. We saw the limits of FAs, or DFAs, NFAs. We saw the limits of PDAs. Now we will see, then now our claim is that the Turing machines are the ultimate, or the most powerful Turing computation model. And if we see that there is some limitation with Turing machine itself, it means that those are the problems for which we cannot solve. We cannot do anything. Right now, it also creates other philosophical questions. That is it because uh, there is really no way nothing can be done, or is is it our inability to think about the certain computational model which can solve? Is it possible that some other alien civilization uh, who is more advanced than us, uh, who also knows some computation, and they have found a solution to some of those questions that we are unable to resolve? Is it because their way of thinking about computation is much different than what we think computation is? Or is it the case that whatever that we think about computation is a universal in a sense that if we cannot compute anything, nobody can do that? So we will try to, to resolve some of these issues which are some which are partially mathematical and, and computational and mostly philosophical. So we will touch upon those questions in detail, maybe in later days. Yes, there is a viva for the midterm, and I have not yet um, uh, decided the time because I have not yet created your midterm. I, I will let you know in coming weeks because there are like around 45, I think more than 40, around 50 or more students who are online, so I think it will be. Take some time. Okay, sir. Sir, one more thing. Uh, uh, what is coming in the quiz in the next quiz? Uh, everything that we have done after the CFGs. That is everything that we have done for Turing machines so far. Okay, sir. Okay. So we will stop at this point. I will just. Write one thing that we will cover next class. Uh, and it should not come as a surprise because we have been doing it for every competitive model, uh, which is the non deterministic theory machine. During machines that we have seen so far all, are all deterministic. Now we will think about a non deterministic theory machine. What does it even mean? How it works? What are the benefits? What are the advantages? What are some use cases? And is there any computational advantage of non-deterministic clearing machine over deterministic clearing machine? And there is a pessimistic answer. No, there is no computational advantage. Computation in terms of uh, the things that we can compute, but there are some other advantages that we will see. But we will talk about all these things in next slide. Any questions? No, sir. Okay, so the so the topic for quiz are Turing machines. Whatever that we have done for Turing machine, except for the non-deterministic. Okay, so I think we should stop here. And uh, if you have any any other question, please let me know. But otherwise, we can stop. Uh, there's there's an interesting question. <clears throat> is there any research going on a machine which has more power than TM? Um, it's a very controversial question, actually. Uh, controversial because there is some research on some unconventional models of computation. And one of the unconventional model of computation is the quantum computer. Please check it then. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> so, so one research is in the area of uh, computational 
unconventional models of computation. And one un unconventional model of computation is the quantum computers. But this is controversial. When I say controversial, it is because uh, many people, many mathematicians, and many computer scientists uh, don't agree with that, that it is, it is possible, it is even possible, or is it even a valid question to ask that uh, something which cannot be done but by Turing machine can be done, right? Uh, so this is an invalid question according to many uh, computer scientists and mathematicians. And uh, I, I also think the same way. So, but quantum computation and, and, and people working in quantum computation and some other unconventional models of computation, uh, they also agree with that actually. But the thing is that they are in, they are very, I mean, uh, optimistic that they might get some solution after some time. And, and then, so, so they, they keep working and, and, and even though they know that it is not possible, at least with our current understanding of, of mathematics and computer science that we might be able to break the barriers and we might be able to break some physical limitations, uh, but they, they have been working. And there have been some progress. For example, people have been working since 1960s and 70s. Uh, Richard Feynman, which, was the, which, which is very famous physicist, uh, he was a very famous physicist who got Nobel Prize in theoretical physics. And toward the end of his life, toward in, in, in 70s and 80s, he worked extensively in, on, on the field of computation. So uh, there is, there is uh, I mean, a lecture series called Feynman Lectures of, on, on Computation. So he worked in computation as well, but he was more interested in terms of quantum. And, but, but things have changed and they have progressed and advanced a lot. Uh, so we have a professor at IBA who works in quantum computation, uh, Dr. Jibran Rashid, uh, quantum information in quantum computation. So, so there is some promise over there, but there are other unconventional models of computation which, 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 are, which are unlike anything that we have seen so far. They are extremely different. They are completely different, most of the time weird, and um, all sorts of crazy things that you can think are are there in those unconventional models of computation. People have been working on infinite models of computation. People have been thinking on computation uh, using chemicals and, and biological computation and so many other things. Uh, but the problem is that most of these unconventional models are not realized. I mean, there is no physical counterpart to these machines. So these machines may exist in on paper in, in mathematical equations, but it is almost impossible to think about a physical machine which can carry out those computations. Uh, or maybe it's completely absurd to even think about a physical manifestation of some of those machines. So, so there are many unconventional models of computation. People have been thinking, philosophers have been thinking, mathematicians and computer scientists have been thinking, uh, but so far we do not have any. Even the quantum computation, which many people claim in, in, uh, that this may solve some of the problems of, of present day. Um, most of these claims are just fake. Uh, they do not have much substance. But anyway, so there, there's some promise in quantum computation. Uh, many big companies, Microsoft and Google and AI, um, Facebook and, and App, Apple and Amazon and some other big companies are working on quantum computers and for a very long time, IBM is also working and they will spend billions, multiple billions of dollars on quantum computation. So it is possible that, that we end up, it ends up to be a huge scam, or maybe we see a big quantum computer at the end of maybe in five, 10 years, and that will change everything. Yeah, but, but nothing is clear. I hope that answered it. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, that's all for today. I will end the class. And if you have more questions, please just let me know. Okay, thank you very much. Take care. And I'll see you on Tuesday. I will announce about the quiz before that. Okay, thank you. Bye bye.